Good morning, Upstate Church Five Forks. All right, now, come on. If we were at 845 service, I'd expect that. We're at 1120. Coffee should be flowing now. Come on. Uh, there's more coffee out there if you need it, but that's okay. As Steve said, my name's Corey. I had the privilege of hanging out with y'all for a few minutes this morning and getting to unpack the Word of God. I had the privilege of serving as teaching pastor over at Harrison Bridge and so excited to be here. I just want to echo what Steve said. Uh, if you're part of Upstate Church Five Forks, I hope you are. And you have not expressed your thankfulness for Dustin and his family. Let me just say this. It is one of my great privileges to serve alongside of him. That man does so much in so many ways. Uh, You have no idea. One instance, Steve just mentioned it was the getting to know you. Uh, To oversee that and to do it with the excellence that it is done with, it's a whole nother ball game. So my encouragement for you guys this week, take a moment, uh, send Dustin a text. Let him know uh, how thankful you are. I mean, my goodness, look around. Uh, You guys are back to three services. We are literally adding a Saturday evening service for you guys. And so, man, my goodness, like how God is working in the midst of Upstate Church and especially here at Upstate Church Five Forks, it's just something to behold. And uh, I want to echo again what Steve said. Uh, If you're part of Upstate Church Five Forks and you are not inviting your friends, family members, coworkers to your Easter service, you're doing it wrong. There is no reason why this place should not be packed out every single service for Easter weekend. It's not so that we can pack the room, but it's because we know people, they listen a little more on Easter weekend to the message that they'll be hearing. And so we're praying that God will move in mighty ways. Hopefully you'll join us in that effort of inviting people there. So we're covering our next stop in the Revelation series, Revelation 14. If you're like me, every time I turn the page in the book of Revelation, I say something like, well, that was a deep passage. Maybe the next chapter won't be as deep. Lo and behold, it's even deeper. And so I literally said that to Melody last week. I said, okay, well, maybe Revelation 14 won't be as deep. And well, here we are. Uh, So hold on. It's going to be a deep, deep passage because here's what we're talking about. The end of the world. It's what you woke up on a Sunday morning, right? Hey, let's talk about the end of the world. But here's the thing. It's actually a good thing for the Christians, as we'll see. If you're like me, though, when I say the phrase end of the world, there are a few things that pop into mind. One, I, I think of it from a negative sense because we dread that, right? Contemporary culture tells us, man, we don't want to see the end of the world because I like my life right now. I don't know about the end of the world. There's a lot of nervousness around it. Or if you're like me, I dated myself last week at Harrison Bridge and called myself a geriatric millennial. That is actually a positive turn. I was born in 1985, right? Best year ever. Uh, but here's the thing. It's actually a great term, and it's a real quick takeaway for the other geriatric millennials in the room. You can get a pay raise tomorrow, all right? Go to your boss and say, I'm a geriatric millennial. I'm uber valuable to you because here's why. Here's why it's a good term. You can connect with the boomers who knew a time before the internet, and you can connect with the Gen Zers who all they've known are the internet, right? We're like the middleman here, so we know how to speak the language of both. So go tell your boss, I'm uber valuable. You should give me a raise. You can thank me later, okay? But along those lines, that means I grew up in a a certain time period of of music, right? Late 80s, early 90s, best time of, of music. If you think differently, that's okay. You have poor music taste. That's all right. But one of the songs that comes to mind And my millennials or older probably can finish this in here. When we think of the world, REM, it's the end of the world, and I feel fine, right? I literally looked up the lyrics to that. I listened to that song in my sermon prep. You're like, oh, goodness, that's all right. You listen to it, too. You're a heathen as well. That's all right. But here's the thing. I read those lyrics, and I'm like, my goodness, like, there's actually some humor in there, right, in that song. But I thought, how much has this song and culture at large shaped our view of the end times? That we, we dread it or we don't really want to deal with it. We, we come to Revelation and as I, I told Harrison Bridge when we first started the series, the way I used to treat Revelation was if I don't read it, I don't have to deal with it. So I'd read everything else in God's word and just ignore Revelation because it scared the daylights out of me. But here's the thing. It is good for us to read God's word, all of God's word, and it has something to say to us here today about the end of the world. And even for the believer and the non-believer, there is a call here today in Revelation 14 to respond in an appropriate way. To give us a little bit of backdrop, John is going to tell us the same call, the same view that he has in Revelation 12 and 13, but it's actually from a different vantage point. Chapters 12 and 13, John told us about all the suffering that is going to come, that is here now, and in the interim and the in-between, and that will come 
come from Satan and the unholy trinity. We saw that in chapter 13. We saw that in chapter 12. And the call there is for the faithful saints, the believers, the followers of the Lamb of Jesus, to stand strong, to run the race with endurance, and to be faithful to the call no matter the suffering. Well, now here in chapter 14, what we find is he gives us the end game. All right, so the previous two chapters, he's talked about, hey, here's what you're going to face. But then now he moves and says, but look to the end. Look to the end of history. It's like I work with a lot of teams, work with a, a Hillcrest football a lot. And one of the things is when you're going through a workout, you feel like you're about to die. What gets you through the workout? What's on the other side, right? And so this is what John is giving us here. He's saying, hey, keep your eyes on what is coming. And that's what we find in chapter 14. And so we'll read all of chapter 14. At the, after that, we'll unpack it with three points, and we'll talk about how we should respond. So look with me. Chapter 14, verse 1. John writes, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, that is Jesus, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. You'll remember, if you were here in Revelation 7 when we preached on it, this is the same number that he's referencing here. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song. We believe this song is actually coming from Revelation 5, 9, if you're curious there. They were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel, this will be the first of three angels here, flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Again, you hear hints of Revelation 5 there. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third Follow them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, this is the beast from the previous chapter, and this image and receives a mark, again from the previous chapter, on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Verse 14, then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man. We believe this is Jesus with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for the grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. And blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. If your coffee hasn't woken you up yet, this surely will. Oh my goodness, there's a whole lot going on here. Now, to give us the right mindset of Revelation 14, 
John is actually telling us, he's giving us a viewpoint, an image here of what's happening in Revelation 20 and 21. If you haven't figured it out already, Revelation is not chronological history. That is, if you read chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book, it's not going to make any sense. You're going to be super confused. It's apocalyptic literature, the prophetic literature that is written thematically with different themes and interludes and pauses. And you have this imagery over here and this imagery over here, but they describe the same picture. It couldn't get any more confusing. Well, Revelation 14 is actually an interlude before John looks to the next vision, if you will. And so in Revelation 14, we see three things about the end of days, about the end of the history. The first is this, is that history ends with a song. History ends with a song. Now for me, I I went to USC. I, I was a history major. I'm a history geek. I'm the type of guy, I literally just finished the book Last uh, week, that was on an ambassador from the United States to Germany in the 1930s. Riveting stuff, I know. This is what I read for fun. And so when I think of the end of the world, in my mind, in my history mind, what I think is like, all right, we finally hit World War III. Nukes are dropped. The guy who wasn't supposed to touch the red button, he touched the red button, and we're blown up, and we end with a bang, right? Little would I think that history would end with a song. That doesn't make any sense to my contemporary understanding of the end of the world. Yet what we find here, what John gives us in Revelation 14, namely in the first few verses here, is that history does indeed end with a song. And so we have some questions. What is this song? Who gets to sing this song and what does it mean? Well, let's tackle the who gets to sing, who gets to participate in this chorus of this song here. John tells us, well, it's 144,000 who have not taken the mark of the beast, but have the mark of the Lord on them. As we said earlier, this is pulling from Revelation 7. If you remember from Revelation 7, it's okay. If not, that 144,000 is actually a symbolic number. It's not literally 144,000 people. Our odds would not be very good then. So this is a symbolic number here. There's other questions along who gets to sing the song because he says, They are virgins who have not defiled themselves. They are those who no lie was found in their mouth and they are blameless. And I don't know about you, but I've told a couple of lies and well, now I'm not in the 144,000. So what does he mean here? As we said, 144,000 is symbolic. And as is used in Revelation 7, so it's used here in Revelation 14, it is encompassing all believers. You say, but wait, Corey, there are those of us who are married and, and this and that. What John has in view here is the lifestyle that is lived, not necessarily the specific lifestyle, because if we were to say, well, only those who have not been married get to sing this song, that's a pretty negative view on marriage, right? But if we go back to the Gospels, Jesus speaks of marriage in good terms. He says it is a good thing. Paul says about marriage in Ephesians 5, it is a picture of the gospel. And so marriage is upheld in Scripture as a positive thing. It is a good thing to seek. And so we know it can't mean that. So it's not a specific lifestyle, but it's the way of our lifestyle that is honoring the Lamb. You'll notice there it says, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. This is that John chapter 15, abiding in the vine, abiding in the one. We are the sheep that know his voice, and wherever he calls, we go obediently there. No lie was found, and they are blameless. As I said, that kind of knocks a lot of us out, maybe all of us out. But what's in mind here, again, is a life that's characteristically looking more and more like Jesus day after day because Jesus has saved us. And give you a quick example here. You go back to Noah's Ark. What we're told there is Noah was a blameless. He was a righteous man, but he wasn't a perfect man. Go read what happens when he gets off the ark, right? But he was righteous in God's sight. And so therefore, he was was thought of as blameless here. We are not blameless. We are not righteous by our own doing or not doing stuff. What is in picture here is the person that has been redeemed by the lamb that is mentioned, that is Jesus. And that is we stand on his righteousness, his blamelessness. We stand on his finished work and not me checking or not checking a box. And so who gets to sing of this song? Those who have trusted in Jesus. And what is the song? It's a song in Revelation 5, 9 that speaks of who God is, that he is worthy to be worshipped. It mimics a lot of what we just sang in the throne room song, that we are upholding the characteristics of God, that we are celebrating them, we are worshipping them. This is the song the redeemed sing. And so the question becomes here today, are you one of those who get to participate in that song? 
I love our student team. Got to hang out with them for two years as student director before I moved over to evangelism. And one of the things I love that they did, actually this reckless a few weeks ago, I was told they, they went to every student in the 530 students and they asked them this question. On a scale of one to 10, how sure are you that you know Jesus? And they asked every student that. I'm like, man, that is a phenomenal question. And here's why. Though we sit here on a Sunday morning and say, Corey, how sure are you? I'd say a 10. But some of us came in here on two wheels after blessing out our family, telling a couple lies on the way over. And in my flesh, I'm like, I may feel like a four or five, honestly. Right? Y'all, that's all right. Y'all think y'all all tens too. That's okay. But here's the thing. It's a reminder that those who sing this song are those who have found their standing in the Lamb. Not in what I do, not in what you do, not in what I haven't done or won't do, but it's in the Lamb and His finished work. And so if you cannot answer that question here today with a solid 10, my question to you would be, what is your next step? And I believe the answer to that is, we need to have a conversation, not to cause you to question your salvation, but to know for sure that I know the Lamb and I will be singing of this song that day. For the believers in this room, here's what that means. Is my life right now declaring that I am ready to sing that song? Because a lot of times we shove end times, so oh, I'll, I'll get right with Jesus right before he goes back. Here's a newsflash. We have no idea when he's coming back. So, so to push it off like that, I, I would believe is negligent on our part. We often shelve it. Well, I make the changes in my life that I need to make later on. Well, I don't need to do that right now. I still got plenty of time. Uh, James writes, your life is but a vapor, a mist here one day and it's gone the next. You have no clue when this day happens. I have no clue when this day happens. What I do know is that my life that is called for in terms of witness that is called to live for Jesus here is one that should be showcasing that I will publicly be seen as one who can sing the song on that day. And that is asking the question, do my choices, my thoughts, my words, my deeds, do they line up with the lamb who calls me to sing such a song today? It leads us to the second point here. Not only does history end with a song, history ends with a victory. If you're like me, you're like, okay, I, I, can, I can get along with this, right? There is a victory. There's a victory for those who have trusted in Jesus. But John, again, he gives us a little bit of a curveball. He talks about the victory from a defeat standpoint. Because here's what we know. Whenever there is a victory for some, it's a defeat for others. Like yesterday, I, I'm a USC alum. We're having a historic season. We beat those old Florida Gators yesterday. And we were victorious. And it was a great day. And we're marching on the March Madness. And it's going to be glorious there. But here's the thing. We had the win and there was a loser, right? And so what John says here about the victory is there is a day of redemption coming for the saints. And that's what he is holding here for those of us who are suffering as we follow Jesus. And he's saying, look to that day. But he's also presenting a crystal clear picture in the victory as well, that there is judgment, that there is a defeat that is coming here. The second and third angel, note this. The second angel says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Who is Babylon? Well, Babylon was a literal place in the Old Testament, one that was seen as being against God. But it wasn't just a literal place that John has in mind here. The first century readers that would have been reading the book of Revelation, they would have understood Babylon as almost a code word that referenced the Roman Empire. She was seen as oppressive and causing suffering for the followers of Jesus. And we can fast forward that 2,000 years later and see that Babylon is indeed a code word for you and me, not necessarily for the ancient Roman Empire, but for the things of this world. For choosing this world, the temporary, over the eternal. This is what Babylon refers to. And the outcome, the defeat that awaits Babylon is this, is that we are told by the second angel, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual, sexual immorality, she will drink the cup. Now notice here, what's in mind is Romans chapter 1, where God gives the people over to her sin. Where God says, hey, you've pursued sin long enough and you're rejecting me here have the outcome of your sin. And it's not a pretty picture. The picture of the second angel is that it's almost like this person that is forced to drink the cup of wrath from God, a cup of his anger, and they go into a stupor and they fall down, unable to rise again. This is the picture of those who choose the world. The third angel says, along those lines, if anyone worships this beast, if anyone worships that Babylon, to paraphrase it, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
What John notes here from this third angel is this is not just a temporary punishment, but this is eternal punishment in the lake of fire. I've got a little girl, Anna Grace, she's five years old, and one of the things I, I try to do is talk to her about what daddy's talking about on Sunday mornings. And so it's been real fun and entertaining in this series. I told her a few weeks, I'm like, daddy gets to talk about a dragon this week. Daddy gets to talk about a beast this week. So we've had some really entertaining conversations. The other day she was riding with Melody, and they rode by just this field, grassy field out there, and she said, mama, is that where the lake of fire is? And I'm like, man, we dropping some theology in the Watson household here. <laughs> no, honey, that's probably not it, but I like where you're thinking. But here's the thing, the defeat that awaits them is eternal, it's complete, it's eternal suffering here. For those who reject the Lamb, there is no victory here for them. The only victory is the temporary pleasure that you enjoy right now, and it is short-lived. And what is made clear by the Apostle John is this, that the only victory that is worthy to hang on to is the victory that is found in the redeemed who sing the song of the Lamb. So history ends in a victory for you if you know Jesus. But if you choose to reject Jesus, there is nothing but defeat for you. To put it this way, as the Apostle Paul quotes elsewhere in Scripture, you might as well enjoy and be merry in life now because there's not a pretty picture awaiting you before. And the question I ask is simply this. How can you look at such a reality at the end of the world that we know is coming and say, I still want to choose Babylon? I still want to choose this world. If that's not enough, we get this picture later on of harvest that we'll hit on in a minute. But here's the question for some of us right now before we even move on. Does my life, does my life reflect more of the lamb and the song that I'm called to sing? Or does it reflect more of Babylon? There's a clear picture here. There is no fence riding on the end of days. There is no wait. I, I'll wait to figure it out when Jesus comes back. John is clear. The call for the non-believer is to choose your side. This is not meant to manipulate you and, and to saying that, oh, you'll suffer, 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 so let's trick you into believing Jesus. That doesn't work. That's not biblical. But the thing I love about the Bible is, especially when it comes to the end of days, there's no guesswork involved it's in terms of which camp I'm in. It's either I know the Lamb and I'm going to sing the song of the redeemed. Or I'm going to be in that lake of sulfur and fire. Again, not trying to manipulate, scare you, anything like that. That's unbiblical. What I am doing is presenting the crystal clear picture of there are two sides. And you are called, even in the hearing of this room, to choose your side. You cannot claim to be naive to the truths walking out of this room here today. History ends with a victory, though, for the saints. For the saints who are suffering in here, and you're facing the trials of this world and the tribulations, I mean, I wish I could tell you they're going to get better, but John paints the picture that they're probably going to get worse. Lay hold of that which does not move, that which is the firm foundation, that which points you to something better coming on this last day, the victory that Jesus will usher in when he returns. Leads us to the third point here. History ends with a harvest. We've seen history end with a song and the victory, and now we see history ends with a harvest. Now, this is where things get really confusing because there are so many different viewpoints around even conservative scholars that I follow. Some say there are two harvests pictured from verse 14 and all. Others say they're actually the same harvest, just described two different ways. Uh, some say it was one harvest of those who have been saved and one harvest of the judge. And he, let me tell you, <laughs> Anybody who says they have this figured out, they're lying to you. And they probably have horrible theology. Don't listen to them. But here's the thing. The question I love to ask when we come to texts like this, as we've done over at Harrison Bridge, is this. What can we know for sure in these texts? What can we know is a crystal clear truth, verses 14 through 20? Well, one, we see one like the Son of Man that's pulling on the Daniel 7 language. We know that as Jesus there. And we know that Jesus speaks of a reaping of a harvest in the Gospels as well. Luke chapter 10, before he sends his followers out, he says what? The fields are ready. The harvest is ripe. Pray for more laborers. So the harvest is viewed in, in a good context there. Later on, he tells a parable about the wheat and the tares. And he says, as they fully mature as a crop, God reaps, that is, he harvests, and the wheat is put in the heavenly barns, if you will. Those are the saved, those who know Jesus. But the tares are gathered up and thrown into the eternal fire. So a couple of things we can see with these two harvests is this. Number one, 
There is a reaping, figuratively, if you will, of Jesus coming back to get his people. Of Jesus coming back to get the saints, those who have trusted in him, those who sing the song of the redeemed from Revelation 5, 9. That Jesus will come back and set things right. Though you may suffer here today, though you may not see a way out in this world, though the world may be crumbling underneath your feet right now, your homes may be losing their minds, whatever else may be out there, and you're saying, is there any hope? There is hope for the redeemed, that Jesus will be coming for you. Hold on. But we also know with salvation, judgment is always tied to it as well. You cannot have salvation without God judging sin. We see this again in Noah's ark. You go back, Noah, a man found blameless and righteous in God's sight. Him and his family, they are saved. They are put on the ark. And as the rains come, the earth is judged by, of those who have rejected Jesus, or those who have rejected God. And we see this picture play all the way out into Revelation 14, that those who will lay hold of salvation, there is also another side, as we just talked about. Those who find defeat on this day, that is those who have rejected him. And so what we find is that salvation and judgment are clear in these verses. Lastly, in verse 20, it tells us about blood, a whole lot of blood, as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Just to give you a picture here, if John is speaking literally, and some believe he is, this covers the whole border of Israel-Palestine. That's a pretty big picture of blood there, all right? That's a whole lot of blood. Some say it's figuratively, it's the figure of completeness, if you will. Others have different viewpoints. Some say it's the blood of those who have rejected Jesus, which, you know, would be a plausible explanation there. One guy I read this week, a conservative scholar, he actually put forth, he's like, no, I think it's the blood of Jesus that has been slain for those who would trust in him. And his argument was that revelation really can be summed up with blood enough blood enough to cover our sins. And that's, again, a plausible explanation. But what we see here is that on that day, there is a victory for those who know Jesus. There is a defeat for those who reject him. So if you're like me, you look at this pastor and say, my goodness, I picked a Sunday to walk in here on. What do I do with this? Because the temptation is to say, that's such a crazy story, Corey. That's such crazy things happening in here. I don't know what to do with them, so I just put it to the side. I told Harrison Bridge when we started this series, my view of Revelation when I was a little bit younger, even when I was walking with Jesus, was this. If I don't read it, I don't have to deal with it. So I would simply slide it aside because it made me feel uncomfortable. But understand this, every page of scripture is profitable for men and women to read and to apply to their lives. So this has a call here for us here today of how we are to respond. You'll notice, I mentioned three angels earlier, but we really skipped over the first angel. That was on purpose. Because I believe that first angel holds the key to how we should respond to this passage here today. Notice this first angel comes and he brings with him an eternal gospel to proclaim to every tribe, every nation, every language, every people. There are some that would look at this passage that's taking place in all of 14 and say, see, I told you God was just waiting to punish us, that he's just a mean and vindictive God. He just wants to pour out his wrath on us. And why would I ever follow a God like that? But notice here, before the judgment comes, and it, John even notes this, he said, the hour of judgment has come, yet he provides one more way out. You see, if I was God, and I'm glad I'm not God, I would say, nah, those people don't, don't deserve mercy. They've rejected you, God, in chapter 12. They've rejected you again in 13. These are the same people in Revelation 14. My heart would say, drop the hammer on them. Let's be done with them. But here what we find is that God is showcasing his mercy like no other place in Scripture, I would argue. That God is saying, before I roll up all of human history, before this world ends, there is another opportunity to know my love, grace, and mercy. What a picture of this God. That instead of just dropping the hammer on people who have continuously refused him, that he would say, one more opportunity for you to know me. What a picture of love, mercy, and grace here. So how do we respond to this? If you were sitting here today and you're unsure of where you stand with Jesus, how could you reject a God like this? That he would go to such extreme lengths to send his son to the cross to give you another opportunity right before history is rolled up to say, you have an opportunity to know Jesus today. You have an opportunity to be with the redeemed who sing the song of the lamb around the throne on that day. 
Folks, if you're not a believer in here today, this is the right response for you. What that means is starting a conversation after the service. How do I know this lamb that can give me something more than this Babylon that is going to be defeated? That is going to give me something more than temporary worldly success? That is going to give me something more than the temporary things that I value in this world that will rust and fail me anyways? At the end of the day, you have a choice to make today. Which will it be? The side of the lamb or the side that sits in defeat? I don't know about you, but God's presented a pretty compelling case to put my allegiance with the lamb. For the Christian, the call here is this for you. Verse 12, here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. If you were with us last week, you'll know this verse is repeated almost verbatim in chapter 13, verse 10c. Why is John telling us all of these crazy pictures, all of these different vantage points here? For the believers to be encouraged to stand firm and to run the race with endurance. John is saying, I know it's tough. I know you're suffering. I know you're tempted to give up. I know you're tempted to go after Babylon, to, to fall away, to let your life look more like Babylon than a life lived for the Lamb. But what he's saying is, stay the course. It is worth it. The lamb is coming back. The lamb is coming back to set things right and it will be worth it on that day. Though your world may be crumbling now, the lamb is coming for you. He is coming to get his people and oh, what a day that will be. This is the picture, the call, the response for the believer here. Now understand this believer, it's not just, oh, I, I have to double down and really read my Bible and, and maybe memorize the Song of 5-9 and, and do these things. But the picture that's called for here is that we publicly align ourselves with the Lamb. You find this in chapter 12, 13, and 14, that there is an implicit call that we align ourselves publicly with the Lamb who is coming back. So if I'm a follower of Jesus in here, two questions for me. Number one, have I followed through with believer's baptism? You say, what does that have to do with it? Peter makes clear in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, as people are turning to Jesus, he says two things, repent and be baptized. Your first step of obedience as a follower of Jesus should be following through with believer's baptism because it is a public proclamation of what Jesus has done in here. If you're a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized by believer's baptism, guess what? Next week, there'll be a baptismal down here. You need to start that conversation today. It is your first step in obedience of publicly aligning myself with the Lamb. The follow-up question is this, if I've done that, if I've been faithful in that step, does every other part of my life communicate that I am ready to sing the song of the Lamb? Maybe there are priorities that need to be shifted around, some things that need to be swept out, some things that need to be brought in. Or maybe, I wouldn't even say maybe, I would say definitely, going back to the first angel, there's a song I need to share with the world. You have friends, you have family members, you have coworkers, you have neighbors who are on the wrong side of history, who are looking and staring down the barrel of defeat on this day. You have the song that can change everything. You have the lamb that can save them. The question is, are you being faithful with it? Am I confident that I can sing the song of the lamb on that day? And does my life reflect the song of the Lamb this day? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this word, this passage. I know it's an incredibly difficult passage at, at some parts and incredibly confusing at others. Uh, Lord, at the end of the day, though, you make it clear. The call is to know you, to see what you have done, to see the blood that has been shed at the cross of wipe away our sins, to wipe away the things that keep us from you, and to call us yours, to turn us from enemies to children of yours. So God, I pray for those in here who do not know you. May they see a crystal clear picture of what the last day of history looks like. And may it motivate them now to respond by faith to you, the Lamb who is worthy to praise for all days. God, I pray for those of us who know you in here, that we would simply be obedient to align our lives, to prepare our lives even now to sing the song of the Lamb on that day. God, may you so burden us in this room today for those friends, family members, coworkers, and neighbors that do not know you, that do not know that song, 
that we would go out of here today seeking to share it with them and that you would change lives because of it. So Jesus, we ask that you would move during this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen.